welcome to KubeCon on the last Friday. I hope you guys had a good week. I know I did. Uh, it's nice to be in person once again for these talks. Um, so times that I cherish the most uh, is being able to see all you folks and communicate with everybody here at the, at the con. So uh, you're here for Kube Cuddle said what? Because uh, we need to interpret sometimes what Kube Cuddle is trying to tell us about our applications. Uh, my name's Chris, uh, Christopher. Uh, I shorten everybody else's name, so I just go by Chris. Uh, I'm a uh, senior cloud native engineer at, at RxM. I'm an instructor uh, and I'm a consultant, so when I'm not in a class with a bunch of students, I'm usually uh, working on a project to help people adopt Kubernetes and cloud native applications and things like that. And um, I like to talk, so uh, that's why I'm here. And I've done it in the past, so you can check out some of the other talks that I've had uh, the last couple years here at. Um, uh, KubeCon, although it was virtual. Uh, okay, so before we get started on um, interpreting what KubeCuddle is trying to tell us, we need to think about uh, what Kubernetes is doing uh, to deploy our application, right? And so uh, this is a, a resource creation flow that shows uh, often we're the user here in the, uh, the upper right-hand corner. Uh, or upper left, and uh, we're a little bit disconnected from the actual deployed application that happens many steps down uh, in this flow, and so um, there are some swim lanes that happen here, and so uh, we've delineated those to show that uh, you create the deployment as the user, it's then, or, or the controller, let's say, it's then the controller's job to actually uh, submit the API requests to create your applications or to create your pods, and then the scheduler has to do its work to make sure that those things get a home. And then the kubelet has to kick in and communicate with the container runtime and actually you know, create containers and, and have running processes. And in, in any one of these swim lanes, something may go wrong that you may not anticipate. Uh, and you'll need to figure out you know, what's going on. Uh, so we're going to look at each one of these swim lanes um, in turn here. So Kubernetes resources. All of them have uh, things like conditions, phases, states, that uh, some of which are summaries um, that will give you a little bit of information, some clues about uh, the status of your application. Other things are very detailed and will give you exactly the message that you need uh, to know about your application and, and what's happening with it. Um, so they'll all give you some sort of clue to help you with that. When you're first learning Kubernetes, it can be a little bit difficult um, to know where to look and what to pay attention to. Um, you know, I create a pod or I create a deployment and it says, uh, resource created. Oh, cool, everything should be great, right? Well, no, not really. Uh, a lot of stuff has to happen in the background before that actually becomes true. And so if you don't know how to dig in and actually find that information, then you're sort of left stranded and, and wondering how, uh, why, why can't I connect to my application? Kubernetes said it was created. Um, so we're gonna go through those steps here. So things like uh, get with events, uh, get the object itself, um, give you some clues. Uh, it's always a jumping off point, right? We get the ob object, get some sort of summary information and then go from there. Uh, we can use modifiers like uh, minus O, so outputting YAML, outputting JSON, and then getting specific status information uh, using something like status.conditions and extracting the actual message from the condition of, of the object. And of course, kubectl describe is, is very uh, helpful as well. So we're gonna look at some practical examples. We're gonna start with the, the first uh, top two swim lanes here. So we're gonna focus on, uh, as a user, we create the deployment and then what happens, uh, or the controller rather, and then what happens uh, when that controller fails to do what we expect it to do. And so uh, in some cases, we can get some details from a command like kubectl describe. So for deployment, uh, it has some transient states that it will express. So for example, available. This can be a little bit complicated because it requires understanding of the setting which is max unavailable and the other setting which is the minimum uh, ready seconds. So 
some number of pods has to be available uh, for a certain amount of time based on what was expressed in the deployments, uh, essentially rolling update strategy, which uh, determines whether or not the, the uh, minimum number of replicas are available to clients, all right? And so uh, this will tell us yes or no. Is the thing actually available to clients or are there not enough replicas to, to make that available? Progressing happens when we have new RSs or so a new RS comes around when uh, we have a, a new deployment or a rolling update. And so uh, in any of those cases, we'll see the progressing uh, status condition show up. Or if we have a scale up or scale down, it, right, we're making changes to the existing application. And then that shares a condition um, replica failure with the replica set. So to both deployments and replica sets will express replica failure if they can't create a pod uh, for any sort of reason. Uh, stateful sets and jobs don't have as much detail. So stateful sets have a status.conditions uh, part of their object, but it's not easy to find and it's not very detailed. So it's just not as good as the deployment uh, when it comes to being uh, clear about what's going on with pods under a stateful set. And then job has one that's uh, very transient. That's uh, whether or not something finished with a zero or non-zero. But if it's still running, it doesn't, e it doesn't even uh, present that to you with kubectl, right? So uh, it's not queryable at that point until it, gets, uh, it does its work. So we're going to look at a practical example of uh, these guys. So. I've got a couple of YAMLs. I'm just going to apply them, um, and then we're going to see what happens. All right. So I, we're created a bunch of controllers, all the ones we mentioned. And so I'm just going to kubectl get uh, the deployment, the RS, the stateful set. And I'm using the short terms because uh, I'm lazy, um, and job. Right. And so this is kind of our jumping off point. right? Uh, I have a couple of deployments. You can see that they're not whole. I've got a stateful set. It, too, is not whole. Uh, it has a lot less information for me to understand why it's not whole. And the same thing with the job. Uh, it's not done yet. I don't know if it's in progress or if it can't create a pod or what's going on with it, right? So um, there's a limited amount of information that gets displayed here. But if we go through each one, we can get a sense of um, what, uh, what these different columns mean and, and how they can help us. So for example, ready, this is an uh, important concept in Kubernetes is readiness probes. And so uh, at this point, we don't know if um, two of our pods have passed their, uh, or have not passed their readiness probes, or if they just don't exist. Um, so uh, we can look at something like available and up to date to help us with that. Right, so if the pod doesn't exist, uh, it's not going to be up to date, right? And we don't have a, a new revision of this uh, deployment, of course, because it's brand new. So we know that we were able to create two pods, uh, but two are missing. We still don't know why. Uh, the RSs actually have a little bit better details because they've got the desired versus current and ready. And so now I've broken out, you know, a little bit more detail information. We know it's not just that the pods aren't ready, but that they really just haven't been created because the RS has four pods that it wants to create, but only two exist for the one RS. And then this one has zero for whatever reason. Um, stateful set, again, we don't know. They're just zero of three ready. There could be a pod there, but uh, the readiness um, probe may not have passed. Or again, there's no pod that exists there. So what we need to do is. Uh, dig deeper and ask these specific controllers about their statuses. So I can do kubectl describe on one of these controllers. Um, so I'll do deploy, and we'll do the dep ex. And so uh, our only condition that shows here uh, available as false means that, again, we don't have enough replicas. Um, so this ties into the max unavailable. This is just the default, right? So we only have two of four pods. 
So of course, we breached this threshold and we're below the max unavailable. And so we expect this to be false. Uh, replica failure is true. Here's our first indication that the controller is failing to create pods because uh, it has this set to true. And it's still trying, of course, because it's under progressing, uh, set as true. Uh, but the only event we really get here is that the replica set scaled up to four. So uh, what's going on here? We don't have enough clues, so I need to go to the replica set to really get the um, information. And of course, I get a, a huge amount of events, right? So the replica set, remember in the flow, is the actual controller responsible for creating the pods. So the deployment did what it was supposed to do. It created the replica set. But the replica set is not being able to create the pods because I actually ran this in a namespace that has a quota that would be deliberately violated so we would actually see something that was wrong, right? So <clears throat> knowing where to look is key to this. If I'm trying to uh, look at my deployment when what I'm looking for is missing pods, well, the deployment's not responsible for that, right? It's the RS that's responsible for that. And so if I go directly to the RS, I can see events like this. Now, when I don't have that two-tiered two um, relationship between controllers, of course, I can go directly to the controller like a stateful set uh, and um, get the same message, right? There, there's a quota in place that is preventing that as well. And the job's the same way. So if I, if I queried the job, uh, you'd see the quota. Now, there's one uh, that we didn't see that um, is not part of this quota uh, scenario that I've set up. So I'm just going to list all again. So there's one more deployment here called SAEX that is failing to create one pod. And it looks very similar to the other problems that we're having. Is it a quota issue? Uh, they look very similar, right? If we actually look at that, Again, deployment's not going to tell me much, right? Because it's not what's responsible for, create, for creating pods. So just wanted to reiterate that. So what I need to do is go to the RS. So now in this case, it has nothing to do with the quota. This is a failed service account. So the pod spec is relied, uh, relying upon a service account that doesn't exist. Again, I've, I've uh, made this scenario artificial just so we could have something to, um, to look at uh, in our troubleshooting scenario. But just looking at the git output doesn't give, these, give us these details, right? Being able to go into the actual events of the controller and the correct controller uh, will give us the information that we need in, this, in that scenario. So, Going back here, um, when we look at the deployment stateful set uh, with something like kubectl git, a lot of the issues that we're going to have are, are going to look identical. And we're going to see later on with some of these other scenarios that they're going to look identical to those scenarios too. Um, replica sets give us the, the best details about things like ready versus current, uh, not, not matching desired. Uh, pods are going to be missing, right? So I can't query pods that don't exist for their status information. I have to rely on what the controller tells me because I can't query something that hasn't been created yet. Uh, and you can actually see the message field that gets populated as a related condition. So those events will populate into the message field uh, of the, the um, controller. So common causes here are things like uh, quotas, missing service accounts, as, as we saw. Um, now, if your controller can actually create pods, then we're moving down a swim lane, right? If we see that pods are created, then we need to go and look at pod objects for their status, their phases. And so uh, some of the macro states that exist for pods include things like pending. So this is uh, when the replica set has actually successfully submitted the 
pod spec to the API, but uh, the pod can actually be created. Remember that pods are represented by the pod sandbox, which is a container. And so uh, the first bullet here that says that uh, the containers have not been created, right, includes that infrastructure container, that, that pod sandbox container. Uh, running then is where we actually have scheduled it to a node, but uh, the containers can be in any state, right? So they can be uh, restarting, they can be running, they could have gone into a crash. In some cases, we'll get that actually as a, as a message. Succeeded and failed is very straightforward, uh, zero non-zero exit codes. And then unknown is not a, a um, uh, something you'll see very frequently, but it's a, lo a lot of times deals with the communication between the host where the kubelet is running, where that pod is, um, and it's not updating the status. Uh, if we go a little bit deeper, so this, these come with kubectl git pod. That's, a, again, good starting point where we jump off. Uh, but if we get something like kubectl describe, we can get uh, Boolean conditions that let us know if something's ready, uh, if init containers have been launched or they have failed to finish uh, via initialized, whether or not all the containers in our pod are, are actually ready, uh, passing their probes or not, and whether or not it's been scheduled. And this will give us some more details. So if we look at the, the next swim lane here, there's uh, the scheduler responsible for finding pods that have not been bound to nodes once the uh, controller has submitted them, and then binding them to nodes. And so if we uh, look at some examples, I'll uh, clear my cluster. And I'm gonna I need to change namespaces so I get out of the quota so we don't deal with that. So we'll switch to a different namespace without a quota. We'll apply a new set of pods here. And I'll just dump everything because what we're going to need to do is look at the pods themselves. So we'll use get all. Now, if we, again, go back to the controllers where we started the first time, uh, these con conditions look fairly similar to what we saw when there was a quota problem or a service account problem. Uh, so they're not going to be very helpful, right? Uh, we have pods, but they're not passing readiness checks. And so that column of readiness includes everything up to the point where that probe passes. So a lot of conditions are trapped. We already saw uh, upstream that other conditions are trapped by that. So we can't really rely on uh, the controllers to give us that information. Um, we need to go directly to the pods in this case. So I can use git on a pod. We'll call, use the res ex example. And if I go to something like an uh, YAML output, I can see that under the conditions for my pod, I do have a false for the pod scheduled condition. And then I get the actual message uh, as the reason. So this will take the event that traps the reason why uh, the scheduler couldn't schedule it and inject it so I can extract it directly. So I can actually traverse this output if I wanted to with the JSON path outputter, go status conditions, uh, and extract this message um, and find that each one of my pods have some sort of uh, scheduling issue. Right, and so uh, if we go through each one, I'll use describe on the other ones. Uh, we can see that nodes aren't available uh, because of things like resources or volumes. Uh, and because we're dealing with the scheduler and pods, uh, the messages are going to be related to the pods. I, I didn't even bother going to the controllers because uh, they would just lead me on a wild goose chase, right? So if I go up one level, 
Uh, let's do describe. All right. It did what it was supposed to do, and that's the event that we see. It created the pods that it needed to create. It's just the fact that the scheduler can't uh, reconcile the use of uh, the resources. So uh, going back to the pending symptoms, right? The controller outputs are going to look identical to what we saw before when the controller was having an issue. But uh, the pod's going to actually exist as opposed to before when pods just didn't exist. Uh, it's going to return pending, of course, uh, in this uh, scenario. And then uh, you will see pod scheduled as false as part of its status condition. You can get that message field. Um, but there's not going to be any containers. So the difference between something that uh, you need to troubleshoot at the container level versus the pod level is that essentially container status will be no. There are no containers, right? Because they, you can't create containers unless the uh, pod has actually been scheduled. So some common causes here are things like insufficient resources, right? If you don't have uh, enough CPU or memory. Um, things like node selectors. So if I use a, a node name, a node selector, an affinity, that would prevent that. And then volumes. Uh, these are kind of the primary th three things that the scheduler will use to schedule a pod. The last one here, uh, priority class preemption, is kind of a, an advanced use case that I didn't go over here, but can look very similar to the first, uh, which is the insufficient resources, because you'll have a bunch of pods that are running that may be a lower priority class. And so they will then, if a higher priority uh, pod comes along and resources are scarce, those pods will get evicted in favor of one that has a higher priority and needs those resources. In which case, the events you'll see will look like insufficient CPU or insufficient memory because the new pending pods that got evicted, they're replacements for the old ones that were running at one point. But unless you see that actually happen right, in sequence, it's hard to tell that uh, it even happened at all because the new pods are, have no relationship to the old pods that were actually running. So that can be a, a tough one um, to look through. So uh, running. So once we have pods that are actually scheduled and running, right, we're getting down to the uh, bottom swim lane here. Uh, containers each have their status as tracked. So this includes in containers, this includes init containers, this also includes ephemeral containers that that's enabled uh, on your particular cluster. And so you, again, you can use things like the container statuses uh, to group this information and look through it. Uh, there are three different types. Waiting, this is kind of the default state of a container. So uh, anytime it's waiting to actually be created, if it's mounting volumes like config maps or secrets, or if there's uh, a, a crash loop or an error, uh, it will go into a waiting state. Running is anything that's, of course, got a process. And if there's any hooks that have uh, been specified, then those have completed successfully. So you can determine that, OK, my, my hook was uh, ran successfully. And same thing with terminated. If you have a pre-stop hook, you won't see terminated until that completes. Uh, and then you'll get your zero non-zero. So that sounds pretty straightforward, right? Everything's fine, right? You've got a, a controller that has created a pod. The scheduler has uh, scheduled to a node. The kubelet has created the containers. Why are we even talking about this, right? Everything's just fine, correct? Right, well, if that's the case, then we actually wouldn't be here talking about it. So let's clear our cluster again. And we'll apply our new set of pods. And see what sort of things we get into. So uh, it's a little bit fast with the git all. We'll run that again. Right, so again, looking at the controllers, right? If we go from the top down that we've done before, they look very similar to other, other cases, right? It, it's a hard place to start to debug from. But if we look at the pods directly, uh, we get a little bit more details. We know that they have one, uh, in one case, two containers, but one of them is in peril. So in this case, we get an extra status message. This was not included in the official pod statuses. 
this is actually to help us. So uh, we know there's something uh, causing an error here, causing a container to uh, fail and get restarted. And so just having a running in that case would be a lot harder to troubleshoot. So there are other cases that we'll look at at the very end of this that help us debug by replacing the macro states of just like pending running with these other detailed uh, status messages. So although we haven't really looked at that yet, there are ways that we can populate the status section and give us more clues when we want to uh, have an easier time debugging, right? So uh, in this case, I can uh, look at my containers in the container status array. And the easiest way to do that is uh, getting the pod, and we'll do the restart pod. And you can see that we've got two containers in here, and we've got a restart count of four and a restart count of zero, right? And so this one's uh, not ready, and this one's ready. And so we can very easily see that the database here is failing, and then we have the message for the waiting state. So it's in the waiting state because it's in the crash loop. And the related message uh, right in front of us. If I were to instead, let's say, describe this pod, I get similar messages from things like the events, but back off restarting fail container, which I don't know, right? Because it's just a generic message. But by leveraging something like uh, minus O YAML with git, I can relate the actual status message to the container that has the problem, right? And so being able to um, customize what I see coming back from kubectl helps me uh, to debug faster. So I know we're running out of time pretty quickly. Um, now, there's one use case that I want to point out here. This one seems to be healthy and running just fine. Uh, this is a, an example of a Leibniz probe, and so that's easily determined from just describe. You'll see that as an event. And since we only have uh, one container in there uh, anyway, you can see that the readiness probe has failed for that one. So easy enough to get from events. Um, but going back here, uh, nothing seems to be wrong with this container, right? It's running, it's ready, the controller is happy. But uh, if I show you where it's running, so it's running on worker one. And I go over here and I stop worker one from functioning in my two node cluster. If I continue to get this pod, I know that pod's not running. But Kubernetes is telling me that pod is still running. Because remember the, in the, uh, the swim lanes, the agent responsible for reporting these things upstream is the kubelet. I just disabled the kubelet. So I have no indication that this pod is no longer available to clients from this standpoint. But if I, again, dig in, I can see that the readiness condition has set to false because the node controller found that the heartbeat of the kubelet where this pod was running has decayed long enough to declare it unready. We don't actually know what's wrong with this pod because the kubelet is no longer communicating that. But to be safe, we stop sending traffic to it. So this will affect things like endpoints controllers. So this pod would no longer receive traffic from clients. But if I go back to my Git, still running, right? So uh, you have to know where to look sometimes. 
Now, at a certain point, this is going to go to terminating because uh, Kubernetes will eventually give up on the pod or give up on the node and terminate all the pods on that node uh, because the node is not coming back. However, if we just simply bring the node back, Kubelet will heartbeat again, and then uh, the readiness that we saw on the describe will actually flip back uh, to true, and it will continue to uh, receive traffic. So uh, sometimes running doesn't actually mean running, right? Um, OK, so um, turns out all, uh, all was not well, was it? So uh, some of the symptoms and some of the differences between the symptoms. Uh, so again, controllers, not going to be very helpful. Uh, running is going to be set on your Git pod. Ready is not going to have uh, equal values for your current desired. Schedule will be true because we're past the scheduling swim lane. Things like ready and containers ready are going to be false because uh, those containers are going to be uh, unhealthy. And so you can find messages like containers with unready status will give you container names within things like uh, different outputs. And the different states of the containers, of course, will base, uh, change based on cause. The difference between something like a probe failure and an actual error is that running will be true for a probe failure. Ready, of course, will be false. Something that's crashing will be in a waiting state, whereas uh, they'll both share the ready equals false state. Right? Now, with a node failure, again, uh, controllers are going to look normal because we think the thing's still going. Uh, once that timestamp decays, about 40 seconds, uh, you'll see a mismatch between ready and available show up in your kubectl output. Um, <laughs> right? Running and ready is going to be there, and that's going to be completely misleading. Um, so common cause, as we saw with, uh, with this is a node failure, like kubelet is down, can't report in. So what happens when, uh, we saw one example of this, right? Uh, error versus crash loop back off. What happens when we have other examples? Let me clear this cluster again. And we'll apply uh, the other. This is Kubernetes helping us. So the, the status condition of these pods is, has to do with what errors, right? They're actually independent state. So if I look for uh, this, if I use this command, JSON path, where I get the items, uh, so all my pods, and I look, the, look at the phase of all my pods, they're actually all in a pending state. But Kubernetes is helping us by saying, well, this one, uh, which is trying to mount a config map, can't get that config map. This one has some sort of problem with an image, right? A, a mistype in an image or some other issue. This one is not so clear, just container creating forever. So I actually have to dig in on that one. And now in this case, it's a secret, right? We're trying to mount a secret for the pod. It's not working. So something like where a container gets stuck creating forever, it's got a dependency. And that dependency has not been fulfilled. Now in other cases like config maps, uh, better details, right? You can see it just with um, kubectl get, but in this case, we have to uh, dig in a little bit more. OK, so uh, right. So even though the status.phase is always going to be one of the standard phases, getting the container status state.reason is going to give you more clues as to what's actually happening. And Kubernetes helps us by surfacing these types of messages uh, for, and we didn't cover this here because it was in the previous section, so that you can help uh, help you debug common, commonly occurring issues that exist. So now you kind of know what Kubectl said. So thank you guys.